Glory be to God. Glory be to God in the highest. Are we ready for the word? Precious Father, we thank you because the entrance of your word gives light. Breathe upon your word, precious Father. Let there be light. There is a spirit in man and it is the inspiration of the Almighty that gives us understanding. So give us understanding, precious Lord. Open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. And we thank you, Lord, for doing it. For we receive it done in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody say, it's a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. You probably didn't know it, but it's a trap. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to God in the highest. I'm going to share with us a couple of scripture. And I really believe that it will be a great blessing to us. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. So if you have your Bibles, can you open to it yourselves? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. It says, finally my brethren be strong in the lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of god that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil i want you to take note of the word wiles wiles what are wiles what does wiles mean it's a compound word that comes from two words, it's methodia. Methodia, from which we get the word method. <laughs> so when somebody tells you, the guy is using method, you understand what he's trying to say, he's using wiles. Cunning devices, wiles, tricks, wiles, wiles, wiles. Hallelujah. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stay, stand against the wiles of the devil. I'd like to pause and just... Uh, maybe put this in context. Number one, this was written by the Apostle Paul. There is no controversy about that. It's a very clear example of what the great Apostle Paul wrote. And he didn't write this to a Jewish church. He wrote it to a Gentile church in the city of Ephesus. Apostle Paul is speaking long after he has already begun to teach about the new creation realities and teach about the fact that you are saved by grace and teach about the authority of the believer. So this is written upon a foundation of faith. It is taken for granted. The hearers of this verse understood who they were in Christ. So he wasn't speaking to pediatric people. He was speaking to a mature enough audience. Or writing to a mature enough audience. And he's not, this is obviously not Old Testament. He's speaking within new creation realities. And you need to understand that clearly. And when you understand that and you know that we rule over principalities and powers. When you know that we have the victory because Jesus has given it to us. When you know that he has given to us all authority over the power of the enemy, which is what I taught last week, that he has given to us all authority over the ability and capacity of the enemy. It means we no longer should be afraid of the ability of the devil. We no longer should be afraid of his power and his wiles. But there is something we have to be afraid of. There is something we have to guard against as New Testament believers. Authority does not override this. Is there somebody hearing what I'm saying? And it is the wiles, the trickery, the cunning, the deceit, hallelujah, of the enemy. Put on the whole armor of God. So it means the warfare that we are warring against now is more or less a warfare to defeat the wiles or the trickery of the devil. Remember, I gave a scripture and I think it's very appropriate to bring it in now. The Bible says the lion, I mean the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I express the fact that he goes about in the same manner in which the lion hunts. How does the lion hunt? 
The lion is a very thick and muscular animal. It's fast, okay, but it's not the fastest animals. Antelopes are faster than lions. Warthogs are faster than lions. You know, uh, Reeboks are faster than lions. And so on and so forth. Cheetahs are fat, faster than lions. But they are the king of the jungle, so they must have some special tool, some specialty that makes them the apex predator in their field. What is that? It's the manner in which they hunt. The lion has this terrifying roar. And it comes with some heavy low frequencies that get right into your guts. Very ferocious roar. So you know what the lion does? It sneaks upon its enemy. He comes with stealth. It hides in the bushes. You don't know it's coming. You don't know it's the devil. And, and I want you to remember this. You don't know it's the devil. Mind those words. You won't know it's the devil coming for you until he gets really close. And then when it's close, it releases the roar. And when it roars, the sound of that roar is so terrifying that it paralyzes the prey. Those few seconds when the prey is confused is when the lion has the opportunity to pounce. Now it says that the enemy goes about like a round lion. It means he sneaks up on you. He doesn't give you his complimentary card, I'm on my way. He doesn't put a public paid announcement. He doesn't send you a message on WhatsApp. He doesn't warn you. He doesn't give you a call to say, I'm on my way. He shows up. He sneaks up on you. And if you are not careful, you won't recognize that it is the enemy. Sometimes the enemy will sneak up at you as you. And that's what I want to share about today. That it's a trap. Is there somebody hearing what I'm saying? That is a trap. He will sneak up on you as you. And if you are not careful, you will fall victim of yourself. It says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not of your might, of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles, wiles, the deceit, the sneaking, and the sneakiness of the devil. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places therefore because of this <laughs> bros because of this babe take unto yourself the whole armor of god that you might be able to stand on the evil day having done all to stand stand therefore you see, this generation, this current era in Christianity is denying certain things that are dangerous to deny. We don't hear too much talk about hell these days. As a matter of fact, we don't even hear so much talk about heaven these days. We all seem to live in the here and now. And we live for ourselves and ourselves alone. A consumer culture has eaten into the church, into the fabric of the church, where it's about me, myself, and I, my breakthrough, my prosperity, my healing, my destiny, my helper, my, 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 me, myself, and I. And so we ignore some very important things. Remembering that this was written to a New Testament church in new creation realities under the dispensation of grace. Here is Paul talking to them about demons. It's an old-fashioned word when you talk about demons to many people today because demons are not real to them. It's stuff we, we only hear about in Halloween. We watch on horror movies and, and there, but it's not a real reality. But the truth is, it is a tangible reality. They are real and they are all around us and they are looking for ways to take advantage of us. They cannot overcome us by power and might. So they come by trickery. 
Are you hearing me? Somebody said no, a believer cannot have, a, you know, a demon cannot affect a Christian. That's not true. Not true at all. A demon cannot own your spirit. I agree. But all through scriptures, you hear of them saying somebody was bound with the spirit of infirmity. Spirit speaking about a demonic power. Spirit of infirmity. Deaf spirit. Blind spirit. Lame. Etc. A troubled soul like Saul was. To come under demonic influence simply means there is an active involvement of demons attempting to harass a person. And because they can't do it by right upon you, and they cannot do it because the might of Jesus is by far greater than their might. And it is in his might that we stand. Are you hearing me? So they can't do it by their might. So demons will always try to seek advantage over you through wiles, through deceit. And I want to teach you about the number one deceit of the enemy today. And that number one deceit, or should I say the two number one deceits, the two most powerful in his arsenal, is unforgiveness and envy. Unforgiveness and envy. Hallelujah. Unforgiveness and envy. Oh, glory to God. I'll begin with a story, and I want you to see this story, and this is really important. Philemon chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. It begins, this is a letter that was written by Paul the Apostle to a gentleman called Philemon. And Philemon lived in the city of Colossae. Philemon was a disciple of Paul. He, he was born again under the ministry of Paul the Apostle. He had been brought up by Paul. Paul taught him what he knew about Christ and Christianity and labored over him in the past. While Paul labored over him, in his house, Philemon was a relatively wealthy young man. He had a slave. In those days, they had slaves by indenture. They had slaves by birth and stuff like that. That doesn't make slavery right, but they existed. And you know, the truth is that God brings change and reformation into our lives, precept upon precept and line upon line. You don't get born again today and your walk with God is perfect. You grow in your walk with God. And so it doesn't mean that God was tolerating slavery but it was still the law of the land at the time. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Another day I'll tell you how God goes about changing the laws of the land. And that's what we're supposed to do to colonize Babylon with the principles of Zion, hallelujah. And there's a method to that. There's a methodology to it. So, there was a slave in the household of Philemon. His name is Onesimus. And this slave would pay attention when Paul is teaching his master about Christ. And he listened and he listened and he listened and he listened. He understood the fundamentals. He was there when Philemon started speaking in tongues. He was there when Philemon began to was baptized in the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. He was there when Philemon was baptized in water. He was there when Philemon was taught the fundamentals of the new creation reality. He was there when he learned about the God that heals. He was there when he learned about the authority of the believer. So he's there and the household of Philemon as well were all there and you know the Bible says you are saved and your household too. So Philemon had the benefit of the culture of Christ. But Philemon ran away. He escaped his master. And he ran far. And somewhere in the journeys of Paul, and you know in those days you pay a big amount for to buy slaves. Some people will buy slaves and treat them cruelly. But because Philemon was a believer, he believed in treating 
his slaves very well. They were slaves all the same. He will graduate later to understand. But he treated them very well. And Onesimus took him for granted and ran away before fulfilling his time with him. Paul was imprisoned and found his way to Rome. Rome. And in Rome, he comes across Onesimus, the runaway slave. Now, runaway slaves then, if they are ever caught, sometimes they are killed, sometimes they are arrested and returned to their masters, and so on and so forth. But somewhere in Rome, where Onesimus had now made a new home, and who knows what he was doing? Maybe he was a gladiator, maybe he was, you know, a shoemaker, maybe he was a tradesman of some sort, but he's living there, hiding away, and he hears that the Apostle Paul has been arrested and is now in the city of Rome. And the words and the teachings of Paul came alive in his spirit again. And he probably remembered how well Paul had treated him. So he sought out Paul in the prison. And Paul rejoiced to see him and received him. And he began to disciple him afresh. And he became one of the key people that ministered to Paul at a time when he was imprisoned, at a time when many people abandoned him. Here was Onesimus, the slave of this, his old friend. And after weeks turned to months, maybe months turned to years, and Onesimus is now a mature Christian. He's now a minister of the gospel by his own right. He's now a father in the kingdom. Paul now talks to him and says, it's time for you to go back and settle your issues with your master Philemon. Now Paul is at a straight between two because here he is. Onesimus is his son in the Lord, in the gospel. But so is Philemon. Philemon is also his son in the gospel. Onesimus has wronged Philemon. But both of them are Philemon's offspring in Christ. So Paul decides that he's going to send Onesimus with a letter. A letter to his old boss, his old master, Philemon. And that's what we now know. That letter is what we are reading as the book of Philemon. Does somebody understand that background now? So he goes back with this letter from Paul and he comes back to his master. So let's read. He says, To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our soldier, and the church that meets in your home, grace and peace from the Lord our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's verse 3. Let's keep to verse 8. It says, Therefore, Let's skip to, to, yeah, I believe it's verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ, this is Paul's words, hear him carefully. Although in Christ I could be bold to order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now, and now also a prisoner of Jesus, I appeal to you for my son. He owns him. Do you understand what I'm saying? He puts his reputation upon Onesimus now. He didn't say, I appeal to you because of Onesimus. He says, I appeal to you for my son. So he places his mark, his signet upon Onesimus. For my son, Onesimus. Watch this. Who became my son while I was in chains? Now, if you have a concordance that will give you the translations of words in Greek, you'll find out that the word Onesimus means profitable. Somebody say profitable. So he does a play of words here. He says, he became my son when I was in chains. 
formerly he was unprofitable to you, but now he has become useful to you, both to you and to me. If I was to say it with using the Greek word, he was saying formerly he was on Onesimus to you, and now he has become Onesimus to you. Do you understand that play of words? In other words, before he has hurt you, before he has wounded you, before he has cheated you, before he has taken you on a ride, but now he has become useful both to me and to you. Let's read verse 15. And Paul begins to sound philosophical when he says in verse 15 and 16, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but he is even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. To cut the wrong, long story short, Paul was asking Onesimus, uh, was asking Philemon, forgive. You paid a lot of money. You might even still be owing the banks, but forgive. He may have stolen stuff when he ran away from your house, but forgive. He was supposed to have been a Christian at that time, but he valued his freedom more than his Christianity. And yet Paul says, forgive. Is this making sense to somebody? You know, one of the things that really the devil uses to trick us, we only seem to forgive the people we convert. And I'm not talking about conversion to Christ. I'm talking about conversion from bad to good. We condition forgiveness upon reformation. So we will forgive you if you repent and if you turn away from your sinful ways. That's how we work. So we forgive those who are really sorry. We forgive those who have changed. And that change, eh, our exam is more than YX. More than GCSE. You will prove to me beyond any reasonable doubt that you have truly changed. Then I will forgive you. And that's because we miss what forgiveness is. We imagine that forgiveness means we now expose ourselves to those people whether or not they are reformed unrestrained and unwisely, but that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is a total release. And it's not really the person you are releasing, it's yourself you are releasing from the bondage of pain, of darkness. Because if you don't really know, unforgiveness is the devil like a roaring lion sneaking up on you using your own pain against you, using your own trauma against you, using your own sadness and sorrow against you. It comes really close. And by the time he releases his roars, his demon powers have come and invaded your life beyond what you can imagine. You know, the Bible says where envying and strife is, there is every evil work. I want you to mark those words. Every evil work. Do you know what that means? It means unforgiveness and envy. Give satanic powers unfettered access into your life, into your body, into your thoughts, into your mind. It will run you ragged, waste you, your intellect will become like puff puff. Your sound decisions will become irrational. Where envy and strife is, there is what? Every evil 
work. We think we are doing the person we are forgiving a favor. But the real favor we are doing is not to them, it's to us. You are doing yourself a favor when you forgive. When you forgive. Oh, I've been there, done that, I've spent the night. Hallelujah. Spent the night. So Paul says, Philemon, forgive. And then he says, forgive the person you didn't convert. In other words, you can't guarantee, but I am telling you that I have spent time with him. I have fellowship with him. He has ministered to me. Would you be willing to take my word for it? He says, accept him back, not for anything he has done, but for what I mean to you. Forgive him. He says, put it to my account. That's the way I like how it is written in the book of Philemon. He says, whatsoever he owes you, put it to my account. But remember that you owe me your very life. I like that. You owe me your very life. Does that sound familiar to you? Let me show you. Let me show you what it means. Let me show you what it means. Are we ready for it? Hallelujah. I'm, I'm flowing with the Lord, not according to my notes right now. So, hallelujah. Six, Luke 6, 36. Luke 6, 36. And it says, be ye therefore merciful. Hallelujah. As your father also is merciful. Hallelujah. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Wait, 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 wait. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. No, 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 no. We're all freely forgiven. We're all freely forgiven. You're right. We're all freely forgiven. But you break the flow of that forgiveness and unconditional mercy when you hold another person in forgiveness. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. So forgive not and you shall not reap the fruits of forgiveness in your own life. Is somebody getting that? So really, when you forgive, who are you doing a favor? Yourself. No, Christ has forgiven you. You will never experience the fruit of that forgiveness because you have blocked the pathway by your own unforgiveness. And the next verse says, Give! And it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men bring to your bosom. For with the same measure that you use or you meet without, it shall be measured to you again. Do you know he's actually talking about judgment and forgiveness? Not actually about money here. The measure with which you forgive. So you hold the measure. If you forgive in the bucket loads, you will receive forgiveness and mercy in the bucket loads. Hallelujah. If you refuse to forgive, then the enemy has taken advantage of you. And like a roaring lion, his emissaries begin to take possession of aspects of your life. Take possession of your health. Take possession of your mind. Until you look like a caricature of what you once were. All because you allowed darkness into your own life. Somebody hear what I'm saying? You hold the measure. I want you to look at somebody and say, you hold the measure. It's not God that has the measure. You hold the measure. When it comes to forgiveness, it's the measure with which you meet. Let me read a couple of scriptures from the words. And mind you, what I just read is the words of Jesus. It's not the words of Apostle Paul or Peter or anything. So you can say maybe it's filtered through human flesh. These were the words of Jesus. Let me read to you some other 
words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 12, um, chapter 6, verse 12, it says, And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will forgive you also. Matthew chapter 6 verse 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. Are you seeing a pattern here? Look at Matthew chapter 18 verse 35. It says, so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you. If you from your hearts forgive not everyone, his brother, their trespass, every, not just the repentant ones, every, every, by realizing that your experience of forgiveness is predicated upon your own forgiving others. So who are you doing a favor when you forgive? Yourself. Somebody said unforgiveness is like choking yourself with a knife and expecting somebody else to be in pain. Did you hear what I said? Unforgiveness. That's the person you want to, you, you, are, you know, you are holding in unforgiveness. That's him. But you take the knife and you choke yourself and you're expecting him to be the one bleeding. That's unforgiveness. Because the person in pain is you. The person who can't sleep is you. The person who can't eat is you. The person who can't experience joy in life is you. Unforgiveness will blind you. Unforgiveness will rob you. And it's the same with envy. Why can't we be happy when somebody else is blessed? Somebody gets married, you are uncomfortable. Because you are not married. Somebody gets a new car. You find reasons to castigate him. It's probably from bribe money. Because you can't. Envy! Bible says where there is envy, when you begin to compare yourselves with yourselves, there is every evil work. If you are going to remember anything that I've taught today, I want you to remember two things. Number one, it's a trap. That unforgiveness is a trap. That envy, you know, when we start focusing, when it becomes about me, you know, all this time I had lost myself, especially this new generation, you know, I've lost myself, now I'm rediscovering myself, and then I'm going to make sure I make myself happy. I will no longer lose myself and self and self. In those days, it used to be called selfishness. The very root of envy. And sacrifice so much for everybody. Now it's about me. And you don't realize that it's a trap. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say it's a trap. It's a trap. The devil sneaks up on you. He doesn't come with announcement that it's the devil. He comes like that bestie of yours. He comes like that good friend of yours. He comes like your, your husband. And then he makes him hurt you. That's when the roar is released. And all of a sudden, your whole life revolves around the evil that person did to you. And you think you are justified. The sad thing about vengeance is it never satisfied. Even after you've taken vengeance, you are still in hatred and strife concerning the person you have killed. <laughs> it doesn't free you. And all the while you don't realize that all it was was a trap. 
It's you the devil was after. It wasn't ever about the person. Are you with me? It was never about the person. It was about your future. It was about your joy. It was about your welfare. It was about your sanity. It was about your prosperity. It was about your increase. It was about your faith in God. And unforgiveness will so blind you, you can't pray anymore. You can't go to church. It will rob you of your faith. Rob you of your ministry. Rob you of your family for unforgiveness. Because you didn't recognize that it's a trap. I said there are two things that I want you to remember. What's the first one? It's a trap. It's a trap set for you. Not for that person, for you. And number two, you hold the measure. Don't forget those two things. Number one is a trap. Number two, you hold the measure. Please switch this one off. Hallelujah. You hold the measure. It's in your hand. It's in your hand to forgive. It's in your hand to hold that person. It's in your hand to let go and let God. But it's also in your hand to hold back. And when you do, you fall into the snare of the fowler. Hallelujah. Is somebody hearing this? You hold the measure. You know, somebody may ask me, how do we forgive? You know, when Jesus taught us how to pray, did you remember how he taught us how to pray? He forgive us our trespasses as we also forgive those who trespass against us. Hallelujah. The key to forgiveness is to take our eyes of the person who has wronged us and look at the person who has forgiven us. You see it in the ministry of Paul when he wrote that letter. He said to Philemon, forgive him. And if he owes you anything, if he has hurt you and caused you any grief, put it to my account, but remember this. This is the key to forgiveness. Remember this, that you owe me your very life. In other words, we forgive because we are forgiven. The key to the ability to forgive is to take our eyes off our debtors, to take our eyes off those that have hurt and wounded us and look at the one who has forgiven us. Are we deserving of mercy? Have we blown it before? Judge not, he says, that you will not be judged. If we could all have your life played back, seeing every evil you've done, imagine how embarrassing that will be. And yet God forgave you all of that. The only key to forgiving others is to remember what you have benefited by being forgiven. Hallelujah. We forgive because he forgave us. While we look not at our debtor, we look not at the wretchedness of the person's sins, but the abundant glory of God's loving kindness and tender mercies. That Paul the apostle will say, oh wretched sinner that I am. Oh wretched sinner that I am. All through the week, that's all the Lord has been ministering to me again and again and again. 
that bros, it's a trap. I remember when I got into unforgiveness. I didn't know it was me the devil wanted to destroy. When somebody just began to misbehave and then he just rallied so much around himself and began to destroy everything that we were trying to build in God. Then he became, became personal. He began to attack me. And I got upset, I got hurt, and I got wounded. I felt betrayed, but the, the angrier I got, the worse the situation became. I tried to see God, and God would show me from his word. Just let it go, but I couldn't. I kept getting more wrapped up in it, more wrapped up in it, more wrapped up in it. It became my mission. Nothing else was important. We were not going to go forward until we have dealt with this issue. And God says, just leave it. Leave it and let it be. Until it began to define my life. Filter into everything I preached. Made me despair of life itself. To the point where I prayed the prayer of Elijah. You know the prayer of Elijah? God, kill me. No, he didn't take a knife to kill himself. He didn't take a gun to shoot himself. Christians do it with more savvy. We pray. <laughs> God, kill me. Just, 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 just end me. I'm tired of this. I imagine that, that I prayed that. I don't want this anymore. And unforgiveness takes a hold and a root in your heart. If only somebody had told me. And they tried. One person said, look, this is a distraction. The interesting thing, the person himself came and said, this, this is a distraction. The person didn't repent to But was lecturing me that it's a distraction. That annoyed me more. Oh my goodness. Then when I think, oh, I have, I have, I have ended all this. I, 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 I said, I want to get out of this environment. I want to go somewhere else. I went to Lagos thinking I will escape. You know, when the devil want to uproot you from your calling and commission. Went to Lagos. There in Lagos, I met somebody who I heard that so and so said you are this. Hey! I started again from ground one. Then it's Ilori. At least I don't know anybody in Ilori. Nobody knows. And Ilori is Lungu somewhere. Somebody else called, oh, you had this, so, 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 so. We heard that you are. You would think it's a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. It's a trap. Is there somebody hearing me? It's a trap. It's you. It's your soul the devil wants. It's a trap. Even two years after I came to England, Manchester, far away from nowhere. Can you imagine that? I was in one of my son's churches. I was sitting down, and then he came and met me. I said, hey, uh, somebody told somebody who told me. Hey! And then the whole spiral starts all over again. And the truth is that until you decide, there's no quick formula. I remember talking to Archbishop Margaret Idahosa about this. And her advice to me is, son, don't let any human being own you. Don't let anybody so dominate your thoughts that the person will control your happiness and your peace. Get rid of unforgiveness. For your own sake. Didn't understand. I didn't understand. Look at your neighbor. Say it's a trap. I have seen women who will throw away. All they have built and labored for. For 18 years. In their husband's house. 
because of unforgiveness. I can't. I have seen men. One of the most well-behaved men I ever knew in my life. I met in prison. He had become an elder in prison fellowship. Akuse, elder Akuse. Wonderful team man. Soft spoken, very deep in the things of God. I was doing prison ministries and after, you know, going and going again, I had to ask this man, you are just so precious. So I had the boldness to ask him, what did you do? What brought you here? And tears welled into his eyes. And he said, I killed my wife with a machete. And I killed her lover and his son. Hey. When he said it, I, my heart sank. I couldn't believe it. You? Harmless you. And you should see this man. He even speaks in slow motion, you know, by the special, proper gentleman. Proper gentleman. Unforgiveness will rob you of your values. It's a trap. It's a trap for your soul. It's a trap. It's a trap for your ministry. It's a trap. Let it go. It's a trap. Second thing I want you to remember is that you hold the measure. If you just decide to let it go, you, you are set free. My soul has escaped. Like a bird that is set free. I am released. I am released. Oh, I know people who hurt me so deeply many years ago. One of such people. And you know, life just goes around in circles. I had forgiven long ago. Long, long ago. This person hurt me to the core of my being. I lost total self-confidence. I'm talking of a long, 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 long time ago now. Relationship, relationship issue. Said some very deep, scathing things about me. Many years later, after I've released, I'm at peace with myself, I'm happy, I'm joyously married. This same person ends up in my hand as in the person's welfare was dependent on what I do, my choice, whether I help or I don't help. And I thought to myself, if I had not forgiven, there would have been no way. But I didn't give it a second thought. I helped. My wife helped. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Bible says it is better to give than to receive. That's the fruit of forgiveness. I went back after the whole episode and I cried to God and I said, God, I thank you that you gave me an opportunity to bless this person. I never asked for anything. I didn't ask for an apology. I don't desire it. I don't need it. I don't want it. I've forgiven long time ago. God has given me a Manasseh miracle. You know what a Manasseh miracle is? The kind of miracle that will make you forget what the brothers did to Joseph was so painful, sold him into slavery, sentenced him to death, wrote him off like he's, he's, he's dead and gone, lied to his father. Hallelujah. But when he would meet them again, he didn't meet them with acrimony. He had given back to two sons, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Manasseh is God has caused me to forget. That's the meaning of Manasseh. For the Lord has caused me to forget. God will give you a Manasseh miracle in the mighty name of you. He will so bless you that what you now have will make what you lost so pale in comparison. A Manasseh miracle. Hallelujah. 
Let me end by saying this. Paul himself who was advising Philemon to say, forgive, forgive, forgive. He was actually prescribing his own medicine. Because a few years before that, the best apostolic team ever assembled. The team of Paul and Barnabas, called together by God. When God himself said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have sent them. God assembled that ministerial team. Fantastic and powerful team. Their ministry, their joint ministry in Antioch, the Bible says, resulted in the disciples being called Christ-like Christian for the first time in Antioch. In other words, you could say Christianity first succeeded in Antioch because Christianity, Christian, means Christ-like. And you say the disciples were first called Christ-like. What is a disciple? Somebody trying to be like Christ was first called Christ-like in Antioch. So with all the effort of Jerusalem, nobody called them Christ-like. They are trying to be Christ-like. But it's in Ephesus, even unbelievers attested and said, these guys are Christ-like. And it's because of the apostolic combination of Paul and Barnabas. And yet, unforgiveness came between the two of them. A young man, hot head, his name is John Mark. Nephew to Barnabas. I don't know what he did. But whatever he did was so bad that Paul could not let go of it. Later, Paul would testify and say, he abandoned us. How can we take somebody who abandoned us, who, who the cares of this world was more important to him than the cross of Christ. That's the words of Paul, the apostle concerning John Mark. So this guy could have been one of their helpers and then he got a girl pregnant on one of their ministry trips and then absconded with the lady or something. I don't know what it is. I'm only speculating, but whatever it is, it was hard for Paul. And Barnabas kept on interceding and said, look, forgive this boy. Let's go and win him back. Paul says, lie, lie, it's not going to happen. No. Look, you know what the word of God says. No. That's how powerful un un unforgiveness can be. No. No. But if you are the one who teaches it. No! So you know what ended up happening? The apostolic team was fragmented and broken. And Barnabas went his own way, never to be heard about again. Never. From that point, you don't see his name in scripture anymore. Just disappeared into obscurity. And Paul went on. And it was persecution after persecution and heartache. From prison to betrayal to this to that. Until many, 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 many years. When people ask me, so how did you come out of that time of darkness in your life when unforgiveness was eating you up? I could say time heals, but it's not time that heals. It's God that heals through time. Are you hearing me? But you don't have to wait that long because you hold the measure. Hallelujah. So Paul, after many, many, many years, he has seen more betrayals. He has seen people do worse. He has himself failed other people. Paul himself would learn and understand. And he would write a letter and said, send John Mark to me. For he is useful to me. And he uses that word again, Onesimus. For he is useful to me. The same person he had rejected and broke his association with his best friend and ministry partner and, and vice president. He said, come. I forgive. Find him wherever he is and tell him I need him. Imagine Paul saying, I need John Mark. And he was telling Onesimus to forgive. He was only prescribing his own medicine. Today I challenge you and I ask you to forgive because it's a trap. It's a trap. 
It's a trap. You know the thing about the trap? The animal that looks dead that is inside the trap, that's not the person the trap is set for. That's what is called the bait. That's the lure. That person that stepped on your toes, that person that cheated you is only the bait. You are the prey. You are the one that the devil is setting the trap for. It's about you, not them. It's really about you. Your life is that precious. Your future is that precious. Your ministry is that precious. Your marriage is that precious. Your work is that precious. Your sanity is that precious. That the devil will set a trap for you. He knows that he cannot defeat you by power because you have authority over his, his power. So he comes with his wiles and he uses you against yourself and he puts the seed of unforgiveness in your heart today i bear good news and i say that in the name of jesus you are free free precious father in the mighty name that is above every name i pray for that person at the sound of my voice for a restoration of peace for a restoration of peace a release from the snare of the devil. Let's begin to pray wherever we are. You hold the measure. You hold the measure. Oh, Rabase Manola. Telekron de Reme no Suntagai. Jadoro mano krova lo ranada seleda. Yes, we release, we receive a manase miracle. Oh, my Lord and my King, my Father, my God and my Christ. Oh, Rabalo Mohontoge, this is. Thank you, precious Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you glory. Precious Lord, I pray for my brother, my sister, who is hurting and wounded in his or her heart, carrying a weight and not knowing he has or she has fallen inside a trap. Today, their soul has escaped from the snare of the fowler. Today, they know freedom. 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 Cause them to forget. Cause them to forget. Heal the pain in their heart. You knew that woman at the well. She had plenty of intellectual arguments. But you asked just one question that, that pinned her down. Go bring your husband. Where is your husband? And that was it. The secrets of her heart. Every single person here, you know the button to press. To loose them from this snare. And it will not linger a moment longer. We thank you for doing it. We forgive. We forgive. Thank you, Father. Now I'm here to encourage you and to challenge you to release that which is in your hand that we may see the outpouring of that which is in God's hand. Every time that I cry, you hear Because God is faithful and no matter the times that we find ourselves in, we have a reason to rejoice because our God delivers us from every affliction. 
Every time when I call for help, you're there for me. And because we trust Him, we come to Him with confidence. And it's a time to give. And you woke me up this morning. We give first of all because we honor the Lord because He's our Lord. Now may He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness I am grateful you've been so faithful you've been so faithful to me you have been faithful Lord I am grateful to God not out of compulsion some people think that at a time of pressure is a time when you hoard and you hold back it's a time to keep because you don't know what will happen but I challenge you when you dare to release your faith to give unto God you are giving God an opportunity to manifest when you died what can I say Lord, you forgive me again, not again. Whoa. I just want to testify that you want to glorify. You are the one who makes me sing. You make me sing my heart away. Lord, I am grateful to you. In Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It means it takes submission to his lordship to connect with his care. You have been faithful. Lord, I am grateful. Lord, I am grateful. I want to encourage you right now to join us if you are persuaded to do so. Give right now, and uh, as I speak, uh, the number and the account details is being scrolled through your screen. Pick up your device. Oh, I know it's already with you. Make that transfer now, and God will bless you in the name of Jesus. I have been so tremendously blessed in this service. My life will never remain the same. I know the same is with you also wherever you are watching us from. Now before you go, don't forget, like our Facebook page and every time you connect, go a step further to share that page to your friends and on your, on your own timeline. So you help us take this service further and help many more people to connect with us faster. Thank you so much. Till we see you next time. God bless you.